Let me begin with a simple question. How do you think the average member of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints would respond to the following statement? Although Christ's atonement was a process, where would you say Jesus mostly atoned for our sins? A, in the Garden of Gethsemane, or B, on the cross at Calvary? When some colleagues and I surveyed almost 1,000 Latter-day Saint adults and asked them this question, 88% said in the Garden of Gethsemane, and 12% said on the cross at Calvary. One might think, that's an unfair question. People were forced to choose between only two options. To remedy this situation, my colleague and I asked 792 Latter-day Saint adults who did not participate in the first survey the same question and gave them a third possible response, equally in Gethsemane and Calvary. But even with this third option, 58%, still a strong majority, selected Gethsemane only. This indicates a tendency among some Latter-day Saint adults to give priority to the atoning significance of Gethsemane over that of Calvary. Tonight, I will show how the scriptures, Joseph Smith, church leaders collectively, the hymns, and the Savior himself more frequently talk about Christ's crucifixion than they do his sufferings in Gethsemane. I will then provide two reasons why studying the Savior's sacrifice on Calvary can help us and share two examples of how focusing on Christ's crucifixion can strengthen us spiritually. Before I continue, let me be clear that Gethsemane and Golgotha are both vital aspects of Christ's atonement. They are not in competition with each other. My point is that some Latter-day Saints underemphasize the importance of Christ's crucifixion. As we more fully embrace scriptural and prophetic teachings about the Savior's death, we will draw closer to Him. When I learned that Latter-day Saints heavily emphasized Gethsemane over Calvary, I was curious. Where does this emphasis on Gethsemane come from? Did it come from the scriptures? Across the standard works, there are two passages of scripture that talk about Jesus Christ suffering for our sins in Gethsemane. In contrast, there are 53 passages of scripture that talk about Jesus Christ dying for our sins. 21 in the New Testament, 18 in the Book of Mormon, 12 in the Doctrine and Covenants, and 2 in the Pearl of Great Price. For example, at the beginning of the Book of Mormon, Nephi recounts, I, Nephi, saw that Christ was lifted up upon the cross and slain for the sins of the world. The emphasis on Calvary also appears in the non-canonized writings and sermons of Joseph Smith, in which he only referred to Gethsemane one time. In this instance, he does not discuss the atoning significance of Gethsemane. Rather, he uses it as an example of Jesus doing the will of his Father. In contrast, Joseph Smith spoke or wrote about Christ's crucifixion on 34 occasions. Nine of these are explicit statements that Jesus Christ was crucified for the sins of the world. For example, in his 1832 account of the first vision, Joseph wrote that Jesus said to him, Behold, I am the Lord of glory. I was crucified for the world, that all those who believe on my name may have eternal life. On another occasion, Joseph Smith said, The fundamental principles of our religion are the testimony of the apostles and prophets concerning Jesus Christ, that he died, was buried, and rose again the third day and ascended into heaven. And all other things which pertain to our religion are only appendages to it. A focus on Calvary also exists when looking at the teachings of church leaders from 1850 to the present. Collectively, for each one statement from church leaders about Christ suffering for our sins in Gethsemane, there are more than five about him dying for our sins. If we look only at the words of church presidents, the gap widens. For every one statement from a church president about Christ suffering for our sins in Gethsemane, there are more than 12 about him dying for our sins on the cross. The hymns likewise share this emphasis. A study of four Latter-day Saint hymn books, the three earliest as well as the current one, show that less than 1% of the hymns refer to Gethsemane, while 16% refer to Calvary. For example, a popular sacrament hymn states, We'll sing all hail to Jesus' name and praise and honor give to him who bled on Calvary's hill and died that we might live. 
To me, what is most significant is the Savior's own emphasis on his gift from Golgotha. In Scripture, Christ personally refers to his experience in Gethsemane on one powerful occasion. In contrast, he refers to his death more than 20 times. When Jesus Christ defines his gospel in 3 Nephi, his crucifixion is front and center. He said, My Father sent me that I might be lifted up upon the cross, that I might draw all people unto me. Thus far, I have shown a juxtaposition between what the scriptures, Joseph Smith, later church leaders, the hymns, and the Savior himself have taught and emphasized as far as the atoning significance of Calvary relative to what the average Latter-day Saint adult seems to believe. Before continuing, let me be very clear. The events that took place in Gethsemane are a significant part of the Savior's atonement. Many Latter-day Saints have focused primarily on Christ's sufferings in Gethsemane and have not thought as often about his death on the cross. I'm not suggesting that we reverse this error by exclusively prioritizing Golgotha and ignoring Gethsemane. Indeed, we should pay more attention to every facet of Christ's life, including his sermons, miracles, and actions. At the same time, I found that for many Latter-day Saints, an in-depth study of Christ's crucifixion is particularly profitable because in underestimating its significance, some of us may not have studied it as carefully as we could. President James E. Faust taught, any increase in our understanding of Christ's atoning sacrifice draws us closer to him. Better understanding any aspect of Christ's atonement, including and perhaps especially his crucifixion, can deepen our relationship with the Savior. At this point, many people here tonight are wondering, if there's been such an emphasis on Christ's crucifixion in the scriptures and elsewhere, why do so many Latter-day Saints seem to prioritize Gethsemane when it comes to the Savior atoning for our sins? In trying to answer this question, incorrect speculations have been proposed. For example, some have suggested that Christ atoned for our sins and overcame spiritual death only in Gethsemane, and then separately conquered physical death on the cross. Elder Gerald N. Lund called this a doctrinal error and wrote that nowhere in the scriptures do we find indications that on the cross alone Christ overcame physical death or that the garden alone overcame spiritual death. A related doctrinal error comes if we minimize Christ's experience on the cross by saying, what Christ experienced on the cross was no different than the suffering experienced by thousands of others who were crucified. That statement is false. The Savior's experience on the cross was completely different from other victims of crucifixion. Jesus did not just die, he died for our sins. His crucifixion had atoning efficacy. In fact, President Russell M. Nelson taught that all the suffering Christ experienced in Gethsemane was intensified as he was cruelly crucified on Calvary's cross. Although our time tonight does not afford a complete answer as to why there's been a disconnect between the beliefs of average church members and collective church teachings, possible reasons for an emphasis on Gethsemane by church members include the following. Doctrinal misunderstandings, such as the ones we have just discussed. A handful of statements from church leaders from several decades ago that prioritized Gethsemane over Calvary. Some of these statements were published in past but not current church curriculum materials, perhaps giving them outsized importance even though they are out of the mainstream of prophetic teachings. Third, Latter-day Saints have a unique doctrinal understanding about the importance of Gethsemane and so have foregrounded it. Perhaps the most significant reason church members de-emphasize the atoning significance of Calvary is the lack of crucifixion artwork and cross iconography in our church buildings. While not the focus of my message tonight, the scarcity of crucifixion imagery merits attention. I recently gave a devotional at Ensign College on this topic, if you'd like a more full explanation. But to be brief, when Latter-day Saints are asked why their church doesn't display crosses, they tend to paraphrase words stated by President Gordon B. Hinckley in 1975. In response to a minister's question about the lack of a cross in a temple, President Hinckley responded, I do not wish to give offense to any of my Christian brethren who use the cross on the steeples of their cathedrals and at the altars of their chapel, 
who wear it on their vestments and imprint it on their books and other literature. But for us, the cross is the symbol of the dying Christ, while our message is a declaration of the living Christ. The lives of our people must become the only meaningful expression of our faith, and in fact, therefore, the symbol of our worship. It's important to note that in this same talk, President Hinckley also referred to the cross on which Christ hung and died and said, we cannot forget that. We must never forget it. For here, our Savior, our Redeemer, the Son of God, gave himself a vicarious sacrifice for each of us. Thus, while de-emphasizing the church's use of the cross as an institutional symbol, President Hinckley emphasized the atoning significance of Calvary. Symbols are multifaceted. They permit, even invite, layers of meaning. A cursory look at church history indicates that the symbol of the cross has been viewed in different ways across the decades. For example, a cross appears on the 1852 European edition of the Doctrine and Covenants, and a floral cross was present at the funeral of John Taylor. Multiple 19th century Latter-day Saints posed for formal photographs while wearing cross jewelry, including a wife and a daughter of Brigham Young. In addition, a proposal for a cross to be placed on Ensign Peak was approved by President Joseph F. Smith. An article published in the Deseret Evening News stated, the monument, meaning the monument of the cross, is intended as an insignia of Christian belief on the part of the church which has been accused of not believing in Christianity. Moreover, a large cross appears on the gravestone of Elder B. H. Roberts of the 70. While not typical, crosses have appeared on some Latter-day Saint church buildings and continue to do so today. Consider a few quotes that illustrate the diversity with which the cross has been viewed by Latter-day Saints. Eliza R. Snow referred to the triumphs of the cross. A 1915 editorial published in the Young Women's Journal stated, The cross has become a symbol of love and salvation. A 1933 editorial in the Relief Society magazine said that Christ changed the cross into a symbol of glory. More recently, Elder Edward Dubay referred to seeing an image of Christ's crucifixion as one of the defining moments of his life. Elder F. Enzio Boucher said that looking at a crucifix from a hospital bed helped him develop a tremendous hope in the redeeming power of Jesus Christ. Many similar examples could be provided. My point is that throughout the history of Christianity and even within the restored church, Faithful believers have had differing perspectives on how the cross should be used to represent Christ's atoning sacrifice. Regardless of how one views the cross as a symbol, we should focus on the doctrinal reality that Jesus Christ was, in his own words, crucified for the sins of the world. Thus far, I have overviewed the scriptural emphasis on Christ's crucifixion and provided a few possible reasons why church members have tended to focus more on Gethsemane. In the remainder of my remarks, I will provide two reasons why studying Christ's crucifixion can be beneficial, and then share two examples of how focusing on Christ's crucifixion can strengthen us spiritually. First, studying Christ's crucifixion can help us connect with the loving Christ. Some church members focus exclusively on the living Christ, and of course, it is the living Christ that we worship. At the same time, we also worship a loving Christ, and the scriptures repeatedly teach that both Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ manifested their love for us through the Savior's death. Jesus Christ himself called the crucifixion his greatest act of love, saying, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Latter-day Saints throughout the decades have taught the same idea. For example, in 1910, Henry Nesbitt wrote, when I think of the cross, the glorified cross, on earth as in heaven above, resplendent forever, undimmed shall it shine, the eloquent symbol of love. In 1935, Grace Jacobson poetically penned, see the cross and bleeding feet, hear the message tender sweet. 
Hear him calling, gently calling, all mankind to him above. For he gave his life a ransom from the depths of perfect love. Do you want to feel more love from Jesus? Do you want to feel more love for Jesus? Then study the crucifixion, the act that Jesus Christ himself defined as his greatest act of love. By better understanding the Savior's death, we will feel his love in greater abundance and be increasingly able to share that love with others. Although we believe in the living Christ, we can also be strengthened by learning more about his sacrifice and death. Dr. Jennifer Lane, former dean of the Faculty of Religious Education at BYU-Hawaii, wrote, As we think about the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, we can know that he is the life and the light of the world. Christ as the sacrifice and Christ as the living word. We don't have to pick which one to focus on because we can't have one without the other. Jesus is both the living and the loving Christ. A second reason to study Christ's crucifixion is to remember that there are 2.3 billion Christians in the world, and nearly all of them believe that Christ died for our sins, providing Latter-day Saints with a perfect opportunity to build on common beliefs. When I was a full-time missionary, if I saw someone wearing a cross, I probably would have thought, oh, they're different. But if I were a full-time missionary today, I would be so excited. I would say, hi, I can see from your jewelry that you probably believe in Jesus Christ. Could you tell me about your beliefs? After listening, I might tell them my beliefs or share a passage with them from the Book of Mormon that focuses on the importance of the cross, such as 3 Nephi chapter 27, verse 14. Unfortunately, we don't always take advantages of opportunities to build on common beliefs. A Latter-day Saint woman who lived in the southern United States told me about inviting a neighbor to attend her daughter's baptism. When the neighbor presented the eight-year-old with a cross necklace, both the child and her mother froze, not knowing what to do. Sensing their discomfort, the neighbor took back the cross and said she would get the child a different gift. Regretfully looking back on this experience, the Latter-day Saint said that she wished she had seen this as an opportunity to rejoice with her friend in their shared belief in Jesus Christ rather than let it divide them. Eric Huntsman, professor of ancient scripture at Brigham Young University, recounted the following story. He said, I remember being surprised once when a Presbyterian friend corrected me when I told her that we preferred to worship a living rather than a dead Christ. She responded that she did too. The cross reminded Protestants that Jesus died for their sins, but it was empty because he was risen and he was no longer there on it. I was chastened by her response, realizing that just as we do not appreciate others mischaracterizing our beliefs, neither should we presume to understand or misrepresent the beliefs and practices of others. Such mischaracterations happen not only between Latter-day Saints and those of other denominations, but also among Latter-day Saints themselves. A young adult told me that she had an Institute sticker on her car that allowed her to park in the Institute parking lot. She also had a cross hanging from her rearview mirror, which for her signified her belief in the Savior's atonement. One day she found a note on her car that said, why do you have an Institute sticker and a cross on your car? Pick one. I'm not making this up. As recently as one hour and 10 minutes ago, I talked with a man who had been asked not to help prepare the sacrament because he was wearing a very small cross bracelet. These kinds of things should not be happening. I am so grateful that the individuals I have talked about tonight have remained firm in their commitment to the Church of Jesus Christ but I wonder how many visitors or others have left because of unnecessary comments about the cross. Sometimes we thoughtlessly say things like, well, would you wear a necklace with a gun on it if your friend had been shot with a gun? That's anti-Catholic rhetoric that was used centuries ago. We should never say things like that. To be clear, I am not suggesting that we all start wearing cross jewelry. 
I am suggesting that you and I as individuals should let go of any stigma we feel about the cross, and we should certainly never put down somebody who wears or displays one. Let us celebrate those who believe in Jesus Christ and are willing to publicly proclaim their belief in him, however they manifest it. The doctrinal significance of Christ's crucifixion is much more important than how or whether one uses a specific symbol. As we embrace and learn more about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, we'll find that we have something in common with other Christians and a great opportunity to build bridges. I now turn to two illustrations of spiritually strengthening insights we can gain as we study Christ's crucifixion. First, understanding the Savior's death can help us press forward despite extreme difficulties. The book of Hebrews teaches, Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Similarly, the Book of Mormon prophet Jacob spoke of those who have endured the crosses of the world and despised the shame of it. They shall inherit the kingdom of God, which was prepared for them from the foundation of the world, and their joy shall be full forever. Note that in both passages, there's a connection between enduring a cross, despising the shame, and finding joy. As we follow the path of Christian discipleship, we will bear crosses and perhaps be shamed by others for our belief in Christ and his teachings. But Jesus endured his cross and received great joy. He says to each of us, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Note that we are instructed to take up our crosses daily and to do so while following Jesus. Today, when we hear the phrase, take up the cross, we perhaps metaphorically think about carrying our different burdens. How would Christ's disciples have thought about this phrase? The Greek word translated as cross in Luke 9.23 is the same word used to describe Jesus on the physical cross where he was crucified. The disciples had likely seen others literally take up their crosses on the way to execution. Is it possible that to Jesus' disciples, the phrase, take up your cross, had a more graphic feel than it does to us today? Contemplating the realities of Roman crucifixion can deepen our understanding of Christ's call to deny ourselves, take up our crosses daily, and follow him. The Savior did not flinch from the cross he faced. Rather, as Paul wrote, Jesus emptied himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Pondering Christ on his cross can strengthen us to deny ourselves, despise the shame of the world, carry our crosses daily, and follow Jesus even when we feel like giving up. A second illustration of a spiritually enriching insight related to Calvary is how Christ's crucifixion can help us overcome sin. The Apostle Paul writes, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh, with its passions and desires. Thus, Paul uses crucifixion language to motivate us to destroy any remnants of evil lying within us. In effect, Paul encourages us to nail our sins to the cross of Jesus Christ and leave them with him on Calvary. In the same epistle, Paul writes, I am crucified with Christ. This visceral image suggests that to follow Christ, we must follow him to the cross and spiritually crucify the natural man or woman in each of us. In fact, at the conclusion of Galatians, Paul writes, In the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, the world is crucified unto me. Think about those words, the world is crucified unto me. Paul seems to suggest that because of Christ's crucifixion, sin can become less appealing, eventually becoming dead to us. While such a state may not come immediately, it will come as we increasingly draw closer to Jesus Christ and understand his atoning sacrifice. As Elder D. Todd Christofferson taught, if we are among the penitent with his atonement, our sins are nailed to his cross. How can we crucify our lustful flesh and thus decrease our desire to sin? At least one approach is to accept the Savior's personal invitation to fix our eyes on his crucifixion wounds. 
the living Christ has said, look unto me in every thought, doubt not, fear not. We often stop, but notice the next part of his invitation. He said, behold, meaning fix your eyes upon the wounds which pierced my side and also the prints of the nails in my hands and feet. The more we remember what he did for us, the more we will do what he asks of us. Perhaps this is why the Book of Mormon prophet Jacob wanted all of us to view Christ's death. In Mormon, encouraged his son Moroni to let the death of Christ rest in his mind forever. Accepting the scriptural invitations to behold Christ's wounds, view his death, and let Christ's death rest in our minds forever can strengthen us to, in Paul's words, crucify the flesh with its passions and desires. Although Latter-day Saints tend to give atoning priority to Gethsemane, as we've discussed tonight, the scriptures, Joseph Smith, church leaders, the hymns, and the Savior himself all more heavily emphasize Calvary. Throughout the history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, there has been a diversity of opinions about the meaning of the cross as a symbol. Many Latter-day Saints have viewed it as a symbol of love, glory, and triumph, perhaps suggesting that some of us today could reevaluate our current feelings towards the cross as a symbol. We will fortify our relationship with the Savior as we focus on an event he often uses to identify himself. Our feelings for Jesus will grow as we recognize him as both the living and the loving Christ. We will feel a greater abundance of the Spirit as we rejoice with other Christians in our common belief that Christ died for our sins. A deeper understanding of Christ's crucifixion will strengthen us in our trials and help us to nail our sins to his cross and leave them there. These and many other powerful principles will distill in our souls as we, in the words of the Apostle Paul, glory in the cross. Studying Christ's death can change our lives. Think of something like the sealing ceremony in the temple, how Christ's crucifixion is literally at the center of a sealing ordinance. There are so many ways we can find peace and healing as we contemplate the cross. Of course, the Savior's crucifixion should not be the sole focus of our studies. His life and his parables, his resurrection and his miracles also merit a lifetime of study and careful examination. President Russell M. Nelson has promised, the more we know about the Savior's ministry and mission, the more we understand his doctrine and what he did for us, the more we know that he can provide the power that we need for our lives. In Doctrine and Covenants, section 46, the Lord lists several spiritual gifts. The very first gift listed is to know through the Holy Ghost that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he was crucified for the sins of the world. This testimony is a spiritual gift each of us can receive and develop at increasingly deeper levels. President M. Russell Ballard taught that every member of the church is entitled to and can develop an apostolic-like relationship with the Lord. Learning more about every aspect of Christ's life and atoning sacrifice will help us gain this witness. My heart is filled with gratitude for the Savior. He's Christ crucified, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He is the one who liveth and was dead and is alive forevermore. He is our peace, our Passover, our life, and our Lord Jesus Christ. May we each strive to learn all we can about him, including the sacrifice he made on Calvary. I testify and witness to you that he lives, he is the living and the loving Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.